Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Thompson, and I'm Brockton's Ward 5 City Councilor. I want to welcome you all to my uh, ward meeting, and I appreciate you all being here. I'd also like to thank my guest speakers, um, the District Attorney, uh, representatives from the Sheriff's Department, uh, City Council, uh, the, the, the uh, Mayor's Office, um, uh, Police Department. So uh, we, we have a lot of guest speakers here to speak to you about uh, what's going on through their departments, ex in, including the uh, School Department. <clears throat> so this is my first in-person meeting uh, of the year. Um, around November of last year, I, held a, I, I recorded a podcast. I was able to put out a bunch of information through that podcast with the help of the BCA. I just thought it was a different way to present information to the community. So I had a lot of fun doing it, and uh, I look forward to doing that again. But I also believe it's important to hold these in-person meetings so that we can have some uh, dialogue uh, back and forth with some questions. Uh, the, the podcast that I recorded is available through my Facebook page. It's available through the uh, BCA website and uh, YouTube, uh, the Brockton channels. So I ask that you check that out. A lot of good information was put out at that podcast. And please provide me your feedback. Uh, tell me what you think of that medium. <clears throat> I prepared an agenda. I hope everybody has an agenda in front of them. I know we're running a little bit behind, but um, I wanted to give people an opportunity to appear tonight. So first, I wanted to start by saying it has been an honor to represent Ward 5 over the last three years. And I look forward to further representing the ward over the next year and hopefully uh, into the future. I have spoken with many of my constituents uh, and we discussed issues of public safety, schools, infrastructure improvements, and economic development in the ward. I have supported dozens of business owners and homeowners in the wards with their petitions and applications before the Zoning Board of Appeals, the Licensing Commission, the Planning Board, <clears throat> and, and uh, other boards of the city. I have worked closely with the Mayor's Office, multiple department heads, the Brockton School Department, the Brockton Police Department, our Fire Department, the Brockton Redevelopment Authority, the Downtown Business Association, the Metro South Chamber of Commerce, the President of Massasoit, our state delegation, and uh, multiple business owners and residents to ensure that our neighborhoods in Ward 5 are safe areas to live and raise your family. I have also worked with these groups to ensure that our schools provide quality education for our, for our uh, children, economic, economic opportunity for the workers of our city, and modernized infrastructure to improve the quality of life for us all. Additionally, as ward counselor for half of our city's downtown, I have worked to ensure that our downtown is developed orderly, properly, both residentially, commercially, and recreationally. So this evening, you're gonna hear from the Plymouth County District Attorney, Tim, Tim Cruz. You also hear from representatives from the Plymouth County Sheriff's Department, the Brockton Police Department, the Brockton Public Schools, and our State Senator, Mike Brady. I look forward to updating you on the progress of our ward regarding the Christos lot, downtown development, and infrastructure improvements in our ward. Again, I thank you all for being here tonight, and I hope you enjoy tonight's presentation. Now, I'd like to introduce the Plymouth County District Attorney, Tim Cruz. Thanks, John. Thanks so much, John. I appreciate it. No problem. Uh, I want to thank Councilor Thompson for inviting me here tonight. I appreciate it, being able to get out and talk. And like you said, it's great to actually see people face to face again as we get away from uh, the COVID issues, even though it's up and down all the time, I think it's, it's good to get out as, in public as much as we can, and I appreciate that opportunity. Um, as uh, the counselor said, I, my name is Tim Cruz, and I'm the Plymouth County DA, and I've been the DA now for 20 years, but I've been around Brockton a lot longer. I've worked, uh, I was a, a, an intern in Bill O'Malley's office in 1983. That's where I began with the Plymouth DA's office. 
And then from there, I became an assistant DA. And I was an assistant DA here in Plymouth County, here in Brockton, Plymouth, Hingham and Wareham, but primarily Brockton, up to 1989 when I left, and eventually opened up my own private practice here in Brockton, where I defended a lot of people for 12 years. And I defend a lot of cases in Superior Court and in District Court, and I did the best I could to represent the people that were being charged with crimes to make sure that they got their rights in court, were zealously represented, and that we could go forward, because that's the way our system works. But I'll tell you, when I started back in, uh, you know, back in 83, Brockton was a different place. Brockton was, a, for the, anybody that remembers Brockton, especially in the, the mid to late 80s, and the crime that was going on here back then, it was inundated. Every night, every single night, there were up and down Green Street, up and down many of the side streets and multifamily houses. You know, the police were kicking in doors with warrants, trying to get drugs and guns off the street. And I remember talking to those, the older retired police officers then, and they would tell you that, you know, they were kicking in a door at midnight. And usually they were barricaded. There was chicken wire. They would get in there. People would flush the drugs down the toilet. They'd always send a cop down to the basement with a sledgehammer taking the pipes out. The, the landlords didn't like it, but that's the way they got the drugs. And they got them for the, for the purposes of the prosecution of the cases. And, you know, and by the time those individuals, if that happened at midnight, by the time court opened the next morning, those places were back in business. And then Brockton laid off 40 or 50 cops in the early 90s, and it's never really caught up numbers-wise since then. And that was a very difficult and challenging time, I think, in the city. And uh, a lot of those men and women came back. Uh, and from there, as we progressed now, Brockton had some bumps in the 90s, and also when I became DA in, in 2001. And now, where are we now? And I think you need to look at the progress that we've made now, because as we stand here, notwithstanding what you may read in the newspapers or see on television, you know, Brockton's numbers have never really been better in the last 25 to 30 years. They really haven't. And that's because of a lot of good people and a lot of good agencies understanding that things are about partnerships and working together. That's what makes the difference. So the DA's office works in, in conjunction with the Sheriff's Department, works in conjunction with the Brockton Police, works in conjunction with the Parole Board, the State Police, the FBI, the ATF, probation, parole, everybody working together, sharing information. You know, we've seen, we've, we've, we've been reaching out for grants for a, number, for a period of time. And, you know, we were, if, if you remember, if you were back here 15, 20 years ago, we remember Weed and Seed and Project Safe Neighborhood, which were anti-gun, anti-violence programs where we were able to get monies and target certain areas of the city of Brockton to right, try to weed out crime and seed in business. That was the big mantra there. And Brockton did a tremendous job of getting those monies and putting it back into the community. It really did. And now as you go down Main Street in Brockton and you look at all the housing and you look at the, the establishment, the commercial establishments, and you look what's going on, Brockton Neighborhood Health and Massasoit's down there right now. The unemployment business just moved from one section of Main Street to the other. It's really remarkable. Uh, and, and I applaud you know, the mayor and all the, the councilmen and all the people that are working hard to make sure that they can make Brockton the place that it really is and, and make sure that we can all talk about the, the positive things that are going on here. That's, to me, what's really important, because we're always going to hit bumps in the road. Uh, we just are. I mean, the Brockton police, notwithstanding their best efforts, they're under-resourced. And I know people are trying to always get our numbers up. Right now is a very challenging time to be a police officer, to be a prosecutor, to be a firefighter, to be EMS, to be the first responders who are going out there, who's now their jobs have expanded so much more than what they were. You know, I, five years ago, if you told a, a Brockton police officer you'd probably carry Narcan with you, they'd look at you like you're crazy. Same thing with the firefighters, same thing with EMS. Dealing with the opiate crisis has been a real challenge, uh, and it's another added burden as to what they do. But, you know, I just wanted to go over some numbers if I could, uh, and I want to read them because I'll mess it up because there's too many of them if I don't read them. Uh, but uh, historically speaking, uh, there's been a 20% decrease in violent crime in the city of Brockton between 2015 and 2020. And these are FBI statistics. These aren't my numbers. You know, they come from the city, they go to the FBI, and they put the t together these categories. There's been a 21 percent decrease in aggravated assaults between 2015 and 2020. There's been a 19 percent decrease in armed robberies between 2015 and 2020. There's been a 27 percent decrease in last season thefts between 2015 and 2020, 26 percent decrease in shooting incidents in that time period, and 35 percent decrease in shooting victims between that same time period. And at the same time that we're watching our numbers go down violent crime-wise here in the city and also in the county, we're also watching the, uh, the, the decrease in crime in Plymouth County itself between 2011 and 2020 has gone down 46 percent. 
and at the same time, there has been a 79% decrease in the number of inmates serving a sentence at the Plymouth County House Correction. Think of that, 79%, and yet your numbers are going down. So what does that tell you? That tells you something's working. That tells you that the right people who are out there committing crimes and hurting people, whether they be my family, your family, whatever, those people are being removed from the community, as they should be. They're being held accountable. But it's a very small group. And so when you're talking about smaller numbers like that, I think that's a really positive thing. And so you have to ask yourself again, so, so now as we go forward to 21 and 22, uh, in 22 so far, there's been 11 incidents in which someone was hit by gunfire in Brockton this year of 2022. Last year, altogether in 21, there were 20. This year, 12 people hit by gunfire total. One individual was hit twice in separate incidents. 22 total in 21. Five murders so far here in, Bra in, in the county, four by guns, one by stabbing. In 2021, there were eight homicides. There have been 12 overdose deaths in Brockton, eight of which were Brockton residents, 43 overall in Plymouth County, and there's been two suicides in Brockton, 19 overall in our county. So when you look at all those numbers and all those different things that are going on, um, you have to ask yourself, how is, how is Brockton numbers going down? When you look across the country right now, and you look at some of the crime in some of the urban communities that are going, whether it be Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, Baltimore, uh, New York, Philadelphia, and their numbers are skyrocketing. I think, once again, it's the collaboration with the partnerships. It's a lot of front-end work that we're doing on, with kids right now. And we've actually been doing it here in Brockton dealing with children who witness traumatized events in their lives for 20 years. 20 years. It's nothing new here. Brockton was leading the way with our office working in conjunction with many other groups, helping the kids get uh, the treatment that they needed at the outset. We go to schools now and make our schools trauma sensitive, helping the kids, high at risk kids, so they get the help they need. So we keep them out of the cycles the cycles of domestic violence, the cycles of child abuse. We watch our, you know, our Children's Advocacy Center, which is here in Brockton on Pleasant Street. You know, last year there were roughly 1,000 kids who were physically or sexually hurt in Plymouth County. And of those kids, the vast majority of those cases, you can't prosecute them because the kids aren't able to do it. So what's important from that? Making sure that you help that child and you remove him from the situations that he or she need to be removed from so they can't get hurt. Because if you don't, what you're going to see is today's victims turn to tomorrow's perpetrators. That's why these kids need the help. That's why we work with BMZ, Brockton Area Multiservice, which provides resources for these kids. And we work with DCF and all these other state agencies making sure that we can help these kids as best as we can. Working together with strong partnerships, whether it be you know, the Sheriff's Department, whether it be, uh, you know, we, we've been working a lot with the Plymouth County Drug Abuse Task Force. Because uh, as we watch kids dealing with trauma in their lives, and we watch kids who are being in a position that they were high at-risk kids, and as we watch how successful those programs were here in Brockton, and it's now gone na nationally, they call it Handle with Care now, which started here in Brockton, and now we, we call it something else. Some, I'll be honest with you, West Virginia came up with a way better name than we had, so I, we all call it Handle with Care. Handle with Care now is from Massachusetts is out of our office, the DA's office here in Plymouth. But as, as we were coming out of that, we then ran into the opiate crisis in 2013, 2014. So now you're dealing with uh, our numbers between 2013 and 2015, fatal opiate overdoses doubled. So what the heck was going on? And that's back when oxycontins were out there, oxycodones were out there, a very strong level of heroin. Heroin, you know, now, if you can find it, but heroin back then in 2013, 2014, 2015, it was very powerful stuff. And right now it's very powerful stuff. When I was a young prosecutor back in 83, 84, when we send out drugs for drug cases, they go to the crime lab, they come back with a purity level, and they also come back with what it is. They, and in the purity level back in the 80s of heroin that was coming back to us, you'd see 20% pure. And the reason it was, so, it was so weak was that drug dealers were stepping on it, is what they would call it. They would take inositol, they would take some vitamin B substitute, and they'd make more from less. And that way they'd sell it and be a weaker brand. The last few years, the heroin that's out in the streets has been 90% pure, 95% pure, and that's not con talk counting about fentanyl, car fentanyl, and there's more kinds of fentanyl that are coming up our way also. So it's, it's, it's an ongoing challenge. And just when you think you're coming out from our task force and all the things we're doing for kids here uh, on the opiate issues, then you get hit with COVID. And now you have a whole different level of mental health issues that are going on. Make no mistake about it, the criminal justice system is the depository of mental illness and drug, and drug issues. And there's always gonna be bad people in the world and they have to be dealt with. But we have to put ourselves in a vehicle that we can help the people that we can help so we can stop the cycles of domestic violence, we can stop the cycles of people who are being hurt. 
That's what I want to see, and that's what I think we've been doing, and that's why you see the numbers go down, because I think we've been doing it for, for quite a while, uh, and I think we've been doing it better. And when I go around the country now and I talk about drug endangered children, which is another program we're doing, or all the grants that we're doing right now dealing with human trafficking as we partner up with Health Imperatives here in the city of Brockton, trying to stop that insidious issue that's going on in our county. And also going everywhere, it's not just our county, it's everywhere. You know, it's like you, you, you can't really put a zip code on domestic violence or, uh, or child abuse. It's everywhere. It doesn't really matter where you come from. The question is, can you help the kids and keep, to keep that stuff down? So, you know, as you, as you try to put these numbers down, people understand, I think, that, you know, we're now a member again of Project Safe Neighborhood. We work and we partner with the same police departments, the same agencies that we've been working with, and trying to keep and reduce those numbers down. So I'm hopeful and I'm confident that, you know, as we go forward, that we're going to be in a position to continue doing that. And because people need, we need to front end help people. We need to back end help people, and we do that with the sheriff's department. I'm sure Phil Griffin will talk to you about the reentry program that the sheriff has, which is second to none. So people, the, the few people that are doing time in uh, the House of Correction, uh, you, you know, it, it's funny because you hear about you know mass incarceration is, is something you read about. Uh, does anybody have any idea how many people are actually doing time in the Plymouth County House of Correction? Now we have 530,000 people in, in Plymouth County. All right. As of February, there were 80. Eight zero people doing time at the Plymouth County House of Correction. All right, and that's not DOC, which is the Department of Correction. Department of Correction is where the murderers go, the rapists go, the drug traffickers go, the human traffickers go. And back in 2010, the number of people doing time in DOC, which is Walpole, Cedar Junction, Susan Baranowski, uh, those very serious institutions, in 2010 statewide there were roughly 12, 13,000 people doing time there. Fast forward 12 years, now you now you're seeing. There's like 6,000 people in there now. Massachusetts is number 50 out of 50. I mean, you don't often want to brag about coming in last, but we're 50 out of 50 in, of people who are being put in jail. And at the same time, not just in our county, but in many counties, our numbers for the crime goes down. And I think that's really, that's really what it's all about. How do you make this base, the, the place better, safer, not just here in Brockton, but in the other 26 communities that we deal with? And I think we've been able to do that by working together with everyone. And I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to continue to do that to make sure that, you know, with the reentry programs like I was talking about, getting people education. We do Corey friendly job fairs with the mayor's office. Uh, we, the, the sheriff has all sorts of reentry programs up there for people who are doing time, who need help because education-wise, job-wise, they need help with parenting skills that they don't have, and they got to come back into the community, back into the society. So we need to make sure that those people are minimize, give them maximum opportunities, and the core friendly job fairs that we've been doing at the War Memorial Hall the last few years, I think have been great. I mean, real jobs, IBEW, electrical workers, we're trying to get plumbers unions involved in it. You know, the average age of a plumber is 55, I know that because my brother's a plumber, and you know, those are the guys and gals that you need, we need tradesmen right now more than anything. And nurses. Nurses are also the average age is 55. Uh, so we need to get more people into those jobs. And they're giving these men that are in the house more opportunities to get real jobs where you can make a real wage. And that's really what it will come down to. You know, working together, making the world a bit better. Now, are you going to solve every problem? Absolutely not. There's always going to be problems in the world. You're always going to need police. We're always going to need firefighters. We're always going to need first responders. We're going to need all those things. But you know what? I think when you look at the, what we've accomplished here in our county and in, here in the city of Brockton, I think that's a very positive step forward. It's something I'm very proud of. I'm proud to work with all these people. I think they've made a huge difference. And uh, with that, I'll stop. And if anybody has a question, I will. And I, and I, and I have to head out to another event, so I'm, I'm doing my questions now. So if you have any questions, I'll put my glasses on so I can see you because I, I can't read with my glasses on because I'm old. Uh, and uh, answer them as best I can. Any questions for the district attorney? You're doing a fabulous job. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thank you all then very much. All right. I, I just. Yeah. I mean, I just wanted to reiterate the comment by uh, Deirdre, uh, Mr. District Attorney, you're doing a fabulous job for Brockton and for Plymouth County. I mean, just those statistics showing the reduction in crime, all tier one crimes, and the reduction of inmates in our uh, in Plymouth County Correctional. Uh, you guys are doing a great job, uh, and I ask that you keep it up. And, um, thank you. you know, thank you for what you do for Brockton. Thank it's, you so much. Thank you. Right. Thank you for being Thanks, here. Great, so our uh, next speaker is uh, Mr. Phil Griffin. 
Uh, he is a, a representative of the Plymouth County uh, Sheriff's Department. And uh, Phil's going to talk about, uh, you know, the, the, the different programs that are available uh, through the Plymouth County Sheriff's Department uh, for the residents of Brockton. Thank you for being here, Phil. Thank, Thank you, you, Council. Thank you for right. the invitation. Great to see you. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Phil Griffin. I think I know quite a few of you. I, I live in the city. I'm a sergeant with the Plymouth County Sheriff's Department, and I work in the Field Services Division. Obviously, everybody knows that the Sheriff's Department runs a house of correction. We transport prisoners. But what a lot of people don't realize is all the internal programs that Sheriff McDonald has introduced as he became sheriff back in 2004. Inside the jail, we have culinary programs, we have GED programs, intensive drug counseling, because the, the probably the main thing that drives people to crime and ultimately ending up in our hotel is a drug addiction. And that's something that we try to address very uh, aggressively and give them the wraparound services they need inside the facility and also outside the facility when they leave. Uh, we also have a very good um, re-entry program. Jim Frazier heads that up and he actually works out of the mayor's office. Uh, mayor Sullivan was nice enough to give him office space in City Hall where he can meet a lot of the returning inmates who come back to the city. Um, the majority of our inmates only serve maybe two, two and a half years and a lot of our inmates come from Brockton and just because of the large population that's just the way it works out so when they get out of jail um, the best thing we can really do to help them is to give them a wraparound services so Jim coordinates services such as you know alcohols anonymous uh, narcotics anonymous gets them involved in vocational training helps them with resume writing He's a very good career center right across from City Hall I think it's called mass mass hire now it changes names daily uh, and they do a very good job getting these people into employment. Um, we also ran a Corey friendly job fair uh, last fall, and that was very successful. Uh, a lot of unions were there. Uh, the craft enterprises were there. Um, it was just very good success. And some of the other programs we run that you might not be aware of, um, our communications department. We field a lot of the, in fact, the majority of the fire calls throughout the county come through our call center. So we coordinate all that, and that's a service that the towns really need because they don't have, number one, have the equipment, and number two, don't have the resources to man these type of uh, facilities. Um, we also have a good program that helps the elderly people. It's a triad program. There's different towns throughout the county that will work together. The Bridgewaters work together, and we have people that go over there and, you know, we'll have cookouts with the elderly people, um, have type, different type of events. Uh, we also work with the the old colony elderly center in Brockton also. Um, we also run a, a detail program. I think you've probably seen some of our deputies that work uh, hand in hand with the Brockton police and other police departments throughout the county. And that's more just as a support system. They call us when they need some extra manpower and we're glad to help them. We also have a, uh, when lost children or people with Alzheimer's, we have a mobile command center, which I know Brockton has used several times. We can come in set it up. We have drones and we've, uh, we have canine that supports that also, our own canine and, and the PD's canine. Um, so it, actually we've saved quite a few people, lost people maybe with Alzheimer's or lost children, maybe to help locate them. Again, it's not just us, it's a collective effort, but uh, we bring our resources out in that. Um, that really covers uh, pretty much all the programs. you guys have any questions I could answer for you? There got to be some. Yes, ma'am. Do you still have the farm where the residents can go and visit? Do yes, you know, I the do. The animals, and yeah. then you got the agricultural flowers and stuff that you sell. You we do, ma'am. Do thank you for asking that question because I actually I was uh, I, think I, a I lot left of that out. Don't know about that. Right. We have a very good farm. Uh, it's an animal farm. You can buy plants down there. You can tour with your children, like a petting zoo. Uh, we also have quite a bit of crops that we actually we'll use in the jail to feed, help uh, defray some of the costs feeding the inmates. But we also give it to the shelters, uh, the homeless shelters, some of the food banks. Because, as you know, in the last two years, you know, the stresses on those agencies have been increasingly growing. So anything we can do to help them. But uh, thank you. Yes, we do have the farm still going. A great place to get your Christmas trees. I know it's a little far off, but uh, any type of shrubs. It's open seven days a week, too. So you can go down there and, uh, and just come right on uh, Long Pond Road. Actually, excuse me, Obrey Street. 
excuse me. Any other questions? No? Okay. Okay. Well, again, my name is Phil Griffin. I want to thank you very much for letting me speak to you tonight, and I'll be here, and if I can answer any questions for you. Yes, ma'am. Um, does the jail still have the inmates that participate in crafts that are sold, like some of the inmates of paint pitches, or they uh, put make leather wallets and stuff like that? I don't know if we're doing that program anymore. I know we're working more with um, more type of vocational programs and training like that. I don't know if we're doing the arts and crafts anymore. I really can't answer that for you, to be truthful. Because I know Walpole used to do it. Right. They, they had actually had a store and stuff. Yeah. I know that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe we're doing that. I think we've gone in a little bit different direction as far as the activities inside the facility. Any other questions? There was Excuse me, ma'am, I, I couldn't hear you. Where is the, um, you said you had, like, animals, livestock? I, I, again, I, the, the fans go and I can't hear you. You said you had, like, a farm with animals and stuff? Yes. Where That's right in Obrey Street. It's where the, the old jail used to be. Uh, you can just what go down there. That? It's open. Uh, actually, it's six days a week that it's open. You can just go down there, and uh, there's, there's animals you can go and see. There's uh, plants you can buy, shrubs you can buy. Um, it's a very active farm. The inmates work on it, and it's uh, you know it's very good for them. It's part they learn a good skill there as far as. Um, that, that's in what town? That's in Plymouth. In Plymouth. Yeah, right in Plymouth. Can it be Thank Google you. if you do Plymouth County Farm? Yes, it will come right up. It's right in Obrey Street. They'll come up and tell us what's going on. Right, it's right in Obrey Street, and our main facility now I call it the new jail, but it's actually probably 25 years old now. That's on 24 Long Pond Road, but uh, the. The farm is down where the old jail used to be. It's down where like the Register of Deeds building is, and down towards like where the um, Jordan Hospital or the Beth Israel Plymouth Hospital is called now. Any other questions I could answer? Is, is that it? okay? Well, thank you very much for giving the opportunity to speak to you. If you have any questions, I'll be uh, hanging out. Counselor, thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. Appreciate Th it. Thank you, and uh, thank uh, Joe for everything. I certainly will. You're quite welcome. Thank you very much. <clears throat> We got a wonderful uh, partnership with uh, both the district attorney's office and the uh, Plymouth County Sheriff's Department. So uh, I, I believe we have a, uh, a gentleman that uh, works out of City Hall uh, two to three times a week. Uh, oh, okay. Yes. And as you know, that's probably the best thing as far as getting people on the straight and narrow is right. keeping the time occupied. The job is one of the best right. things. He does a great job, and Mayor Sullivan is very gracious. You have him office space right, right. in City Hall, and uh, he sees people um, every day. And, and that's so important to have that right here in Brockton, uh, where uh, those who need that sort of uh, referral, uh, both uh, job referrals, drug treatment, um, and just to, you know, stay on the straight and narrow. They don't have to go far. Uh, they can receive all of that right here in Brockton. So that's a great program. We're, we're much appreciated with that partnership. Uh, next, uh, we have a representative uh, from the uh, Brockton Police Department. I asked uh, the uh, captain uh, to be here. Captain to be here today. Uh, to speak about uh, the, the issue that Brockton has with our uh, ATVs. Oh, I don't know if we're ready for uh, the, the issue that we have with our uh, ATV issue. Um, also uh, to discuss the uh, fireworks um, partnership with the uh, fire department uh, for our illegal fireworks uh, this year and also uh, for our uh, enforcement of our noise ordinance, which was just recently passed uh, Brockton's first residential noise ordinance. So uh, thank you, Captain, for being here. Council, council. And we appreciate your time and we appreciate what you do for our city. No thank you. I'm uh, Captain Billy Hallisey, and I'm the head of operations, which is the detective unit and patrol unit. And uh, what I'm gonna speak about tonight is a little bit about the uh, quality of life issues. You know, come to, uh, DA Cruz talked about uh, how the uh, crime rate has gone down and things like that. But tonight we're gonna to talk a little more about the quality of life issues, which is the fireworks, ATVs, and the house parties. They seem to be the big three in the summertime that kind of bothers all the people on, you know, in their homes and whatnot. First about fireworks, what we're doing is we're working with the Brockton Fire Department. Every weekend from uh, 10 at night to two in the morning, 
we're sending out our two police officers with two firefighter personnel. And they're taking all the firework calls. They're separate from our patrol division and they're going out just taking firework calls, going to these homes, uh, speaking with the homeowners, uh, confiscating any illegal fireworks that they may have, and uh, trying to educate them on how, you know, it's illegal in Massachusetts to have fireworks. Uh, fireworks have gone down substantially from last year. During the para uh, pandemic, it was, it was crazy. Uh, but our calls went down about 50, 60 percent compared to last year. We're also are working with a uh, task force with state police and uh, Brockton and some of the surrounding towns. And what we're doing with that is we're trying to get to the source of the fireworks. Uh, I don't think it's so much the firecrackers, and the, it's the commercial grade fireworks. And uh, we actually made an arrest last week. Out of town person uh, was traveling with these commercial grade fireworks and he was uh, charged with them. And uh, we're trying to get to the source of these fireworks and these commercial grade fireworks and uh, we're working on that. And we've already made one arrest and uh, we, it has gone down, but I think like July 3rd and July 4th are gonna be busy nights for fireworks. And we may even put in extra people that night. And uh, like I said, these people just go out, they're working with conjunction with the fire department. They go out to every firework call we can. Uh, there hasn't been, you know, as many as last year, but July 3rd and 4th will be, they'll be very busy. Next, we have the ATVs and the motorcycles. Uh, you've seen them, we've all seen them. Uh, it's a delicate situation, a lot of them are underage kids. We don't want to chase these kids, because that can just, a lot of them don't have helmets. We don't want them going 40, 50, 60 miles an hour and get, you know, and get in an accident and get hurt. So we're doing several different things. We have drones now that are assigned to the police department and trying to find where these ATVs and where they go. We've noticed that there's some kind of storage areas where they go and they store three, four at a time. We're trying to educate them, these young kids and their parents about what's really going on and how dangerous they can be. And uh, I think we've seen them on the main streets, not quite as much. We haven't had as many calls as we have last year. We've got, it's gone down. Uh, and education is the key with the ATVs and the motorcycles to have them, you know, act responsibility. And there's places that they can go if they're underage and ride an ATV that's not on a city street. So uh, we're working hard and diligently in trying to get that under control. Uh, I'm sure you still see them. Not quite. We haven't had as many calls as last year, but they're still they're still out there. And the new, new noise ordinance in the house parties, uh, we have what's called an impact shift that's assigned every weekend. The house parties seem to be concentrated on the weekends, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night is a busy night for uh, house parties also. But with the city ordinance, it's a, first, it's a 50 decibels is what they can have 50 feet from the home, and then they can be fined on a noise ordinance. All our supervisors are equipped with these uh, meters that can measure how much these decibels are. And if there's a house party now, we have the impact shift. They're assigned two house parties. And they'll go to the several house parties that are in the area. They'll contact the shift and let them know where they are. If there's three, four different parties that night, we'll know where they are, what the location is, pass it on to the midnight shift. When the change of shifts, we'll know exactly where they are and monitor them. If we feel that they're you know, getting calls from neighbors, we'll take out the sound meters. Uh, before we even take out the sound meters, I think we'll approach the owner ask them, you know, what's going on. It's a very noisy party. We're getting complaints from your neighbors. And I'll see if we can solve it that way. Uh, the last resort is to use this ordinance to find them. We don't really want to go down that route unless we have to. Uh, we're also using social media. Uh, we have one that was this past weekend that was uh, advertised online through the social media where the kids go and they know where the party is and they were charging money to get in. And uh, there's another one next weekend that we're uh, already contacted the homeowner and stated to them that uh, it's illegal to sell alcohol, food, or anything like that without a proper license. So they've been informed of that. We know where the location is and we'll be out there the night that it's supposedly going to happen. So uh, there's a three-pronged approach to all these issues. Uh, there's other issues too, but these seem to be the ones that affect most people most of the time and uh, get up people upset. You know, when they can't get to sleep at night, they have church the next day or whatever they have. No one wants to be up all night. I wouldn't. No one does. But I uh, just want to let you know that you can call anytime. You know, the police department, obviously, there's an issue in the neighborhood and you want it solved, give us a call. We'll send, you know, we'll send cruises out there. But uh, those are the big three, the summer three that we're working on right now. 
But uh, obviously let us know if there's anything else in your neighborhood you're concerned about. But uh, does anyone have any questions or anything? Yes, ma'am. Is there quiet time when people have a party? Yeah, 11 p.m. on the weekends. And it's uh, 10 o'clock on Sunday night. But uh, all times, are, it depends on what the situation is. If it's 9.30 at night and there's huge, and there's a music issue and the music, we'll, we'll go and we'll talk to them at that time. It doesn't have to be a set time. But uh, yeah, there, there is 11 p.m. is the ordinance that is uh, for the uh, sound meter. And, uh, at, you know, we, we'll, we want to monitor these parties as they go along. I want our patrol division to be out there while they're patrolling and saying, okay, I see 30 or 40 cars at this address, mark it down. We come back, we'll check several times without getting a call. So we'll go down and we'll make sure that uh, we can try to keep it under. The first thing is to contact, get in contact with the homeowner before it gets too late and explain to them, hey, what, what are your plans tonight? You know, everyone's different. It could be a wedding that, you know, they're going to be done at 10 or 11 at night. So we know what the situation is. And then back at the office, we can have the CEO of the shift have her, you know, just had a paper with all the lists of all the house parties that night. There's six or seven. This one said they're getting done at 11. This one, all young kids, we got to watch it. Underage drink is another reason. There's no, we'll be right in there and break up the party. We see under, underage kids, alcohol, illegal, done. So uh, that's a different level, you know, of what, what, you know. There's different things we can do. And uh, we need contact from people that are out there that can come call us and say, hey, there's, you know, a big party down the street. It's not too bad right now, but I just want to let you know. That's fine, too. You know, but uh, we're not going to have, you know, we're not too busy to answer these. This is a priority, is uh, people's quality of life. You know, the ATVs and the fireworks and the, you know, I have a neighbor of my, my own in my neighborhood that, you know, for some reason they do fireworks all the time. And, you know, I have a dog and the dog gets upset and gets, you know, if the grandkids are sleeping over, they get woken up and it's, it's not fun. You know, so, you know, we understand what, what all the issues are. And uh, we'll try our best. We have it 100%. And, uh, you know, we have Sergeant Lobo here tonight, too, and he's on the 4 to 12 shift, and he understands, and he, he lives in the city, and he knows the same kind of issues that everyone else has. But uh, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Chief, what's that, ma'am? Yeah, call the, if there's something going on that you're concerned about that might be a problem, lady, and call the non-emergency number, let us know. And, uh, you know, say, say this is like a large gathering down the street. They're not too bad at that moment. You can let us know what's going on so we can go patrol it and uh, see what's going on, you know, later in the night. Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't think that there's anything that can be done about it, but if somebody can, there's two huge billboards advertising phantom fireworks from mm -hmm. New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And they got a small print saying they're illegal in Massachusetts, but the whole billboard is, you know, selling yes. their fireworks. And they're posted, one is posted um, northeast on School Street under the... Yeah, Rainbow I know exactly Street. what you're talking. And the other one is on the opposite side, Center Street. It's the southeast. I mean, that's a very good question. I don't, I, to be honest, I don't know the answer if it's legal to have an well, advertisement over something that's I illegal. I got to the mayor's office. Yes. I was told there wasn't anything that they could do because of, it's privately owned and mm -hmm. they can't tell them what to put up there and this and that. But I'll look a little further into it. You know, I don't know, you know, exactly what the answer would be on an advertising, because you're an advertising illegal product to be sold. Uh, I look farther into it, and you can even call me at my office, and I'll, I'll let you know. But I, I really don't know the answer to that. It's uh, Londonderry, New Hampshire, and I think mm -hmm. the other one is uh, Salem. Mm -hmm. Londonderry, Salem, New Hampshire. I could have the Salem Yeah, and they drive take the drive up and get their yeah. fireworks. Right. And I don't know what kind of grade they are. but um, I'm sure they'd sell them anything. <laughs> yes. And the last three to five years, the fireworks have been horrendous. It, mm -hmm. I mean, for hours and hours and hours, I mean, 3 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the evening, you know. Yeah, I, say, I say the majority of the calls have been between like 10 and 2 in the morning. This, this year, I've heard a couple, mm -hmm. not too bad, I wouldn't complain. Yes, ma'am. I know. 
as the time comes closer, and they don't wait till the third and the fourth of July. Oh no, this they next couple of weeks is, is the busy time. Ahead and mm -hmm. afterwards, and during, and now that we don't have the fair, we don't have those fireworks. Yes. I'm surprised that the city didn't come up with some kind of firework to do for the city, because other towns and cities do. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know where they put them. But I'll guarantee you, we will have people even this weekend, every weekend, they're going to be out every Friday, Saturday night from 10 to 2 in the morning with the fire department. And if you hear them, and you know, and you think it's you know, a little out of control, give us a call. We'll send them out there. We have a deputy chief from the fire department that goes out, and they can give out you know, uh, fines for having the fireworks. A lot of people, there's going to be educated on how dangerous the they can be. And I'm glad the city is cracking down on the fireworks mm -hmm. issue and the noise issue. Mm -hmm. Because some people do party. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can, be, it can be late in the night. And some people have to work. Yes. Oh, yeah. Work. Absolutely. You know, the kiddos and all that. So yeah, we'll do the best we can. Doing it. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Good evening. I'm, um, I have a couple of questions about the rules. Um, you're talk you were referring more to the weekends. What's that about the weekend? That's why I'm standing, because I know my voice doesn't project loudly. Um, you were referring, <coughs> you were talking about the noise on the weekends. Yes. What about throughout the day, even if it's before the 10 o'clock hour, um, could be midday. Could be. You, you can you can call us. The, the noise ordinance, as it's written, that can, they can't we can't find them for the noise ordinance. But there's disorderly house. There's different things that we can do, depending on what the issue is. But if you have, we had used to have a call in a certain neighborhood. It was a kid playing drums outside, and it was during the day, and we'd go down there every time he played and ask him, you know, hey, you're bothering the neighbors. People work nights. People have, you know, they don't want to hear it. And uh, it got to a point that we uh, had to take out a uh, noisy violation, you know, for a disorderly house on him. This was a few years ago. So any time of day, if it bothers you and, you know, you're having an issue with it, you can give us a call. Well, they have the big books to do that. They my house. Yes. So it's in the back of theirs, and it's probably under the 50 feet. But my whole house vibrates. Yeah, I would give us a call so we can come out and take a, take a, take a, at least speak to them. Quite a few calls from me already. Yes. And, and what, what happened when they went out there, ma'am? Um, whenever I call, you guys are very nice, very, very yes. cool. And you told me, I mean, you're busy. And when you get a chance, you'll have someone come out, and maybe within an hour to an hour and a half, it stops. But I don't know if anyone's went there or if they've just stopped. Because there's times, um, maybe 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it'll start. My whole, the bass, that everything is in my house, as if I'm playing music. Yes, ma'am. And then they play four songs and it stop. But it's just enough to stop everything I've been doing for the day or wake my granddaughter. Um, and then they'll start again maybe in two hours. Six o'clock in the evening, we have a pool. We're trying to converse with one another. They hear us and then they start. I, I don't understand it. I don't want to go near the house and ask them anything because anyone who would do that is not a good man. No, that's, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a tough situation. We, I mean, we'll go out every time and speak to them. And uh, if it gets to be bad enough, and, uh, I, would, I would talk to other neighbors maybe and say, you know, if it's bothering us, let's get together and... I'm new, and it seems mm -hmm. as if they were afraid to say something. I've spoken to the neighbor on the other side mm -hmm. and the one on the side of it, so they just don't say anything. And um, I haven't really left my address, but I can, so you can see it's me calling every single time yes. and continuously I can do that. Yeah, all I can say is we'll definitely go out every time you call, and uh, I, I, it should be sooner than an hour. It should be, you know, right away, within a half hour. Uh, so is it during the day or is it like evening? Yeah. Yeah. If that's. Yeah, that's you know that is it, it, like I said. You have your granddaughter in the house. She's taking a nap. You don't you don't have to, you know. And she wakes her up and then it. Yeah, and it gets it gets everyone's day all in a in a tizzy. But continue to call us. You know, if it, it gets you know, and you can call my office. I'll have a supervisor go out and speak to him. Okay, we have, you know, and sometimes you see a sergeant come out and, you know, the people see that, they said, hey, maybe this might get to a level that, you know, I don't want to go down. We can explain to them that, you know, there could be charges involved here if it gets bad enough all the time. Well, I did see this before the next time, and I appreciate that. Um... Yeah, but like I said, it's a, it's a sound doing this, but we can still go out there and speak to them. Yeah. You, know, you know, if it's bad enough, we can do different things. And uh, sometimes you just, you know, if you just speak to him and say, how would you like it if, you know, if someone across the street from you and the kids were sleeping, how would you feel? I think they've been doing it for years. And what surprised me when I did 
drove down Bates Road? Couldn't even hear it. I left my house and we drove down Bates Road. You cannot hear it in the front because the speakers are facing me. Yeah, in the back and the yeah, exactly. You can't. Um, if you come in my driveway, you can hear it a little. It sounds like it's in my house. Have you reached out to them at all, or did you? Have you reached out to them? No. No, yeah. I have not because I, I just I just feel like they couldn't be possibly be a good neighbor. They don't care. About yeah, but we have no problem going down there and speaking to them. Some of the mopeds and bikes that are coming through the area are coming from that house as well. So it's a little wild. Yeah. Well, yeah, we got to speak to them about that. Are they uh, kids on the mopeds? Are they underage? You think? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I just saw one bike on the road. Yeah, and that's. Hey, you jumped up. That's what. Yeah, well, that's dangerous too. But you know, we, we you know the police department works for the citizens of Brockton. We work for you, so you know when you uh, have an issue, no matter what it is, call us and uh, we'll do the best we can to get it resolved. Because quality of life is a very important thing. And the, you know, in, in your own home, you want to be comfortable. And uh, you know, we're here to help you with that. You know, because we're all you know, we we all have houses and kids and everything else, and we understand what it's about. And uh, we we can go out and speak to them and you know, put a little pressure on them to, you know, maybe be more considerate of your neighbors. Yeah, I think it's good. It's just, it's not the way that they're so wrong. And I think this is the thing. So I'm just beginning here. Yeah, I was just going to say, you haven't been there for a summer yet, though, have you? No, this Well, let us know, and, uh, and we'll definitely make it, uh, go down there and speak to them. Thank you, Captain. No we problem. appreciate no your time. Problem. Thank you so much. We just got to get back to the ship. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the captain and sergeant uh, uh, pairing tonight. Uh, Brockton does have a quality of life board. Uh, and so I have my contact information uh, up on the screen right now. I would ask uh, any resident to reach out to me, whether it be through phone, email, uh, private Facebook message. Quality of life is the reason I serve, is to make sure that everyone is able to uh, have the quiet enjoyment of their home and to make sure that they're not being uh, uh, bothered beyond the pale uh, by a neighbor. And so please, always feel free to reach out to me. I can bring any issue in front of our Quality of Life Board. Uh, on our Quality of Life Board, we have the Brockton Police Department, the Fire Department, our code enforcers, uh, our legal team. So uh, it, it's a way to get your issue in front of uh, multiple departments so we can have a, 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 a um, you know, all hands approach uh, to any issue uh, in Brockton. So please, always feel free to reach out to me uh, if you have a problem. It does work. Yep. Right. Um, I mean, Deirdre, we, we had uh, an issue with uh, behind your house, and uh, it was a mess. And then, uh, you know, we, we, we worked together, and uh, we put the pressure of the city uh, on that uh, address to clean up. And uh, they're not there yet. Um, but they're, they're, they're much better, slowly but surely, uh, coming into compliance. And that's just me working with the residents uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, you can live in peace in your home. And so, um, again, I want to thank the Brockton Police Department. And I just want people to know that there are two reasons anybody moves into the community. Number one is public safety. And that's why I had uh, the... District Attorney's Office, Sheriff's Department, and the Brockton Police Department here today to inform all the community members and everybody outside of Brockton that Brockton is a safe community, all right? So uh, we might not get uh, the, the props for that uh, on the news, but Brockton is a safe community, and it's a, a perfect community to raise your family. The second reason is public schools, right? The number two reason why anybody moves into a community is because of the quality uh, of the public school. And I'm happy to report that Brockton has one of the best public school systems in the Commonwealth, if not the country. Uh, we, we have uh, a great leadership from the top. Our uh, superintendent, Mike Thomas, uh, is a great leader. He puts into place uh, some fantastic principles uh, throughout our school system. And uh, today, I invited uh, Judy Sullivan, uh, Brockton's Ward 5 school committee member, to talk about our public schools and the amazing things that are happening uh, in our public schools. And so, Judy, please come on up. Thank you for being here.
Good evening, everyone. I am Judy Sullivan, the Ward 5 School Committee representative, and our schools in Ward 5 cover the Pliff Academy, the Downey School, the school that we're in tonight, the Baker School, and East Middle School. So we have four schools in Ward 5. Presently, the Downey School um, is going to be seeing some changes over there where we are going to be enclosing. There's some like open classrooms in there that have been there since the school built was built because in those days, open um, classrooms modules were common. But now as the years go by, we find out that we need to really enclose those classrooms. So I believe there's four pods down below there that have um, open classrooms and little by little we're enclosing those so that they're, you know, in their own private classroom. Um, also, the modular classrooms there were only supposed to last 10 years. They've been there 20 years in all our schools where you see a modular classroom. Those classrooms have been there 10 years over what they were supposed to be, and they're still being used today. We do have our own craftsmen that go and do repairs and things to them. We had it on the table this year to replace them, but because of COVID, the prices of those went way up, so we have the um, replacement of the modulars on hold. Um, the Downey School also, for once and forever, be getting its own playground, okay? So thank you to Michelle Dubois. She got us some state funding for that. We thank, um, she is our Ward 5 um, representative to the State House, and that is Michelle Dubois, and we thank her for that. And also, um, a key person in this was um, a Ward 6 person, Terry McIntosh, who was a parent of the special education pack here in Brockton. And she was uh, really the force behind that playground. And then there's going to be a mural put up behind the playground that will depict the kind of students that go there. And it, it is a large special education population there. So the pictures of the mur in the mural will depict that. And also we're going to get to put our handprint in the, in the bottom of the mural. So all the kids will get to put their handprint there and uh, the elected officials for that school and the people that were behind the project. So that you're gonna be seeing that probably in the fall um, because the Downey School also is, is run by electric heat. And that's a very expensive um, heating system. So we are changing it over. The engineers are working on a plan to change it over to gas. Um, so that, all that's going on at the Downey School. Um, the next school that's, that's going to see some um, improvements is the East Middle School on Benham Street. In the back of the school is Benham Street and it has a lot of really fences that have been in disrepair for many years. And so those fences are all being replaced. A couple of them have already been replaced. We do have a fence that lines up to the east, the old east side improvement, which that area was bought by uh, a church that turned the, the building there into a church. Okay, and I don't really think they're using the grounds. I don't know much about it, but it's, it's kind of going into disrepair over there from what it looked like back in the day. So um, there was a fence along there, and we, are, we just cleaned that up. Someone uh, from the schools came and took that all down. And there's a lot of brush that's kind of coming into the parking lot, and they're working on taking down some of that brush. So that's the East Middle School. The Baker School is a pretty new school, so Really, we kind of keep up. Linda and I, one of my uh, volunteers, we did a clean up here a little while ago. Um, but we, we clean up. Litter is a big problem at East Middle School. And we have had the DPW put a lot of trash receptacles there. But it seems like the litter still ends up on the ground. I don't know why. So we're working on that. Okay, if there's... A litter bug. Right, we don't want to be a litter bug. So we want to leave the place better than we found it. So if we're using the grounds, we want to make sure that we're reminding people that it is a privilege to use those grounds. And actually, if they are using the parks, I believe they're supposed to get a permit to use the parks. So I think the counselors are going to be talking more about that coming up, right? Okay. So I'm not going to get into that because that's not really my area. Okay. Um, the middle school placement, if you have a grade five student going to grade six, you should have... Um, 
got your placement on the parent portal, it will tell what school your child will go to in grade six, okay? Then also the middle school academy, which is a new um, honors program that we're putting in. Instead of the TAG program, we're gonna have the honors program in each middle school. And the honors program is a program that kind of challenges kids that need to be challenged. It gives them um, you know, courses at a higher level, more projects, and also they will be eligible to be on the Junior Honor Society, which we haven't had before. So that's a big thing. We have a virtual academy since COVID. We have remote learners. We have um, K to 12, remote, still learning remotely, okay, in K to 12. Um, we also have vocational and career programs, which is a four-year program in nine to 12, grades nine to 12, okay? The kids can, will take um, vocational courses and then their classroom courses. Um, some of the programs that we offer through that is computer science, informational technology, construction technology, and graphic communications. They also can go into the SOAR program, which they can work on college courses with Massasoit and Bridgewater State, but they also can take college courses at Southeastern Regional. In the SOAR program, we offer cosmetology, dental assisting, marketing, precision mach machinery, culinary arts, early childhood education, and medical assisting. So these programs are all offered for students in ninth grade if they enter these programs. Transportation, we did take over our own transportation company. We are going to try to start our own busing, okay? The first student bus company used to charge um, us 95,243 per bus, okay? We have approximately 130 buses. The cost, the savings for FY23 will save the taxpayers 2.9 million under the first student price. So that's how much we're gonna be saving in order to have our own buses. We're presently working th with the Teamsters Union on a contract, so the, the budget for this is not fully set because it would depend on how much the bus drivers would be making to drive the buses. So that we'll get more of a updated on that. We also are having a new Promise High School starting in September 2022 for 100 new freshmen. These students were selected because they were having struggles in middle school. Parents can also request for their children to attend the Promise High School. We also are having a new early college program, which will start in September 2022. Massasoit will be our two-year partner, and Bridgewater State will be our four-year partner for that. Where's the Promise School going to be? The Promise High School, I'm not sure where that's going to be yet, but it is going to start in September. We'll be over the fairgrounds this coming year. Well, okay. Okay. Oh, that building right in front. That's right, too. They did tell us that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. The May Center on Summer Street, which I think that's also in Ward 5, isn't it? The May Center? Well, that's four. Okay. That was bought by the city, and we're going to be moving the Keith Center children, which is the, the old unknown school, the old high school on North Warren Ave because that's where the future site of the public safety building will be. So we're moving those students over to the May Center, which the city purchased May Center, wasn't being used anymore. It used to house autistic students, and eventually there'll be a new name picked for this. But that will house the kids from the Key Center, which is Champion High School, Frederick Douglass Academy, schools like- to go to that school for that. Yeah, it will house 400 students. And then we, we have put in a second time. Where's the parking for that? I'm not sure, because I didn't see the site yet. We're supposed to have a tour soon. I didn't see the site yet, but it's all been checked out by the Brockton Public. Right, it's on-site parking behind the building. A lot of it? Enough, enough for our needs, yes. Also, we are trying to get a new high school or a renovated high school. We have applied to the Mass School Building Association two times, and we should hear back in November if we've been accepted this time. Because that, that school has been there since the 70s, and it needs a lot of updates. So that is my report. 
on the Brockton Public Schools, if anyone has any questions. Where would that new high school be, in Brockton? Well, what would you would have to do is MSBA would have to consult with everybody here in the schools. They would have to look over everything, and they would get back to us on everything, okay? So that is for future. That is in the future. And we are hoping that that happens because all the towns around us have new high schools. What about Brockton? Why can't we have a new high school? So we're pushing for that. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Awesome. Great job. Thank, thank you. you. Again, I want to thank uh, school uh, committee member Judy Sullivan uh, for being here today. Uh, the presentation regarding our school system was fantastic. Uh, just a few things, uh, the transportation issue. Um, uh, we, uh, with our contract for first student, we were paying a year what a bus cost permanently. And so uh, the, the fact that Brockton has taken over its own transportation uh, system uh, and provide our own buses, we can provide uh, uh, more activities, uh, more field trips. Uh, we can also do some stuff for the uh, community members in uh, providing them transportation for different events. And additionally, right now with, uh, with, with First Student, there was, I believe, a two-mile buffer. So anybody that w lived within two miles of their school would not get transportation. The fact that we have our own buses, now we can shrink that buffer uh, from a, a mile to a mile and a half to provide more students an opportunity to take a bus instead of uh, walk the streets uh, during the winter time. Time. Um, the, uh, what else? Uh, the Brockton High, uh, the, uh, the renovation of Brockton High. So uh, like, like Judy said, we should be hearing uh, the next few months whether we were accepted into the program uh, to a, a then what would happen there would be a, a walkthroughs, engineering, a final cost of, uh, of renovation would uh, be determined. And at that point, we as a city have really a decision to make. Uh, on, on moving forward with the renovation and the costs associated uh, with renovating our high school. Uh, Brockton would pay 20% uh, of any uh, renovation costs. Uh, the rest would come from the state. Brockton High School and the programs that they're offering, uh, not just the, the, all the clubs that they offer, but uh, with the uh, passing of the Student Opportunity Act, we were able to bring in uh, more intramural sports. That means our middle schools are able to have football and, uh, and, and I'm not sure what other sports, but I believe uh, they have a few more uh, sports at the middle school level that are free to all students. And that's what Brockton does. Bro uh, in the city of Brockton, all of our students do not have to pay for any school-related sports. So uh, that, that's a really uh, amazing opportunity for our youth. Uh, I filed a resolve uh, that will be heard next month to talk about the sports facilities in Brockton. Uh, we, we, our sports facilities are really lacking. We need additional turf fields in Brockton uh, for our, 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 our residents to uh, play on and to develop those rail feeder systems into our high school. Most other cities have turf fields where their middle schools can play all of the sports that are offered at the high school level. And so uh, that's field hockey, lacrosse, uh, football, all these other sports that um, really right now you only get an opportunity to play those sports at the high school level. So we're really behind some of the other school systems in allowing these feeder programs into our high school so we can better compete uh, with uh, surrounding uh, schools. <clears throat> also, uh, the, the, so Southeastern, right? So I think there's a new understanding that, that maybe college with the expense of college and really uh, not the bang for the buck you're receiving in a college education, I think there's a, a, a new movement happening in our country and especially here in Brockton uh, that maybe a, a four year uh, college program that's gonna cost you $80,000 to give you a, uh, you know, a poetry major is probably not the best way uh, to gain an education. And so where uh, people are really focused back on our vac uh, vocational trades. Southeastern, what we're finding is they allow about 500 Brockton students every year, 1,500 are applying every year. 
And so uh, we see that there's a need for additional vocational education. And so Brockton High is going to provide that uh, to Brockton High students with the programs that uh, uh, Judy Sullivan just mentioned. So uh, Brockton High students will be able to take uh, vocational classes at Brockton High. And then lastly, for those who are interested in a uh, college education, Brockton High is going to partner with both Massasoit Community College and Bridgewater State University to provide college level classes at the high school level with the, um, with the intent that you could graduate Brockton High with an associate's degree. So that will knock two years off of any college uh, education and that's going to save every student and every parent tens of thousands of dollars. So Brockton is a, 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 a system, a public uh, school system that's really innovative. Um, we're modernizing our system. Uh, just, the, the, uh, just one quick thing uh, before I invite our next guest on. Uh, the Brockton Public, the, the city, city Council uh, just approved a $750,000 investment in Brockton's auditorium. So that's a new uh, sound system, uh, a new lighting system that will really enable uh, the, the um, students of Brockton who are in the uh, theater classes uh, to really have a top-notch, modern, 21st century um, uh, uh, auditorium to perform their plays. So we're, we're just, uh, we're invested in our school system, we're invested in our students, and you're going to see a lot more uh, innovation and modernization throughout our whole school system. So uh, thank you, Judy, for your efforts there. Uh, the next person I'd like to uh, in, uh, have come forward is uh, Mr. Matthew Campbell. Uh, he is the head of Brockton Community Schools, and he's going to talk about some of the summer programs that are available uh, to our students. Um, these programs do come uh, for a fee, but uh, I, I think I've, my, my daughter's been in one almost every year. She loves it. Um, they have a plethora of different sports, acting, swimming, um, and, and uh, uh, Mr. Campbell will uh, explain uh, what programs are available, but uh, again, we want to provide uh, summer choices for our students. So, Mr. Campbell, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Yes, sir. I am I, at the risk of sound be, being uh, rude to my host. I am not the director of the community schools. I am one of the coordinators. I am the coordinator of recreation and extracurricular activities. Uh, though, you know, it was a very nice promotion. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, as most of you probably know, the school system offers a just massive array of stuff to do in the summers, particularly in the month of July when the kids are out. out. Uh, if you, those watching at home, those here, if you, this is our, uh, Dr. De, Dr. DeBarros uh, put this together this year. This is our program booklet that came out for the summer. Uh, it is available online. If you have kids in school, this is something you probably want to be able to look at. I will briefly go through uh, some of the offerings. There are dozens. Uh, right here, Warp 5 at the Baker School, this is one of our major sites in the summer. Uh, for ages 2 to 5, we have Ocean Adventure Reading Camp. Uh, Math camp for grades three to f three, four, excuse me, who wants to be a millionaire math camp? Uh, we have kitty fun camp for gr ages five and six, and cooperative sports and games uh, is also for, grade, for ages three to four, is also here at the Baker School. Uh, at Brockton High School, as those of you that have been in the city a long time, there is just, the school never shuts down. Uh, act one, scene one, Obviously, has a great reputation that is continuing this year. We have extent, uh, we have uh, get ready, and uh, get ready is our major sports program in the summer, in the month of July, and it's weekly sessions. You can play soccer, cheerleading, basketball, gymnastics, tennis, baseball, lacrosse, boxing, golf, volleyball, and flag football, all available at the high school. And those most of these programs end around 11:30. And at the conclu conclusion of Get Ready, if you so choose, you can go to Junior Boxer Camp, which is sort of like afternoon Get Ready. Similar idea. You, can, you don't just focus on one sport, but uh, again, it's athletically oriented. We have swimming at the high school. We have aquatics. We have aquatics for adults as well uh, in the afternoons. I encourage anyone who wants to get in the pool 
Uh, we have lifeguard training. We have driver's ed, all available to the summer at Brockton High. Uh, as we get into August, we, the two biggest things we have in August are get ready basketball. In addition, uh, driver's ed goes pretty much all year round. Uh, get ready basketball is a two-week basketball camp. Uh, run by Mr. Lewis, who's also the supervisor for BCB basketball, uh, and that's always very well attended. Kids can, go, uh, you know, kids love playing basketball. That's how it's right in the gym at Brockton High. And uh, as you get into the end of August, we have middle school uh, football, which is starts August 22nd this year, uh, and any ch any kid playing in the city of Brockton attending at Brockton Middle School can attend, can go to middle school football. All they have to do is sign up and they're on the team. I hope I haven't taken too much of your time. Does anybody have any questions or? How do they, uh, how would people enroll? What, how, uh, online? It's a great question, Mr. Thompson. Thank you. So if you go to BrocktonCommunitySchools.com, you will see everything laid out for you. Uh, you'll, you'll get a look at the if you go to the Brockton Public School website, you can find the program. But BrocktonCommunitySchools.com will have all the sign-up information, uh, what it costs, where you go, the times, information on transportation. And if you have any questions, you call the, uh, call the switchboard, 508-580-7000. Uh, they will transfer you to the community schools office, and people there can answer any question you have about any of these programs. Thank you. Again, uh, thank you, Mr. Campbell, for your time. Uh, the fact that Brockton provides these types of opportunities for our children uh, throughout the summer is, is really great. As I stated, my daughter is usually enrolled in one of these programs every year. She loves it. Um, at the junior boxer camp, she's allowed to swim, make crafts, uh, different art projects. Um, study math, study the science. So it's, uh, it's a really great program offered by our Brockton Public Schools. If you have a student looking to do something uh, this summer, I, I highly recommend that they enroll. Um, so what I'm going to do now is kind of talk about uh, the ward, right, and some of the things that we have going on uh, in our ward. First thing, I got my contact information up here. Um, <clears throat> So uh, for anybody who, who wants to contact me, uh, the easiest way to contact me is uh, uh, through email. Um, I try to return all emails within 24 hours, a lot of times uh, much earlier than that. Um, I, I've received dozens, hundreds of emails over the past three years, and uh, I really enjoy uh, the discussions that I have with my constituents, from public safety to the schools to infrastructure to development, and what everybody's most concerned about our roads and, uh, um, and our, you know, the wa quality of our water system. So please, in my Facebook page, uh, I don't know if everybody's, uh, obviously not everybody's on Facebook, for, but for those who are on Facebook, I, I try to put out as much information as possible through my Facebook page. So please, uh, uh, like or follow, uh, you'll, you'll receive a lot of information through that page. So right now I'm going to discuss uh, uh, the Christos lot, uh, what's happening in, uh, on the Christos lot, and uh, how we're going to develop that lot uh, in the near future. Uh, secondly, we're going to talk about downtown development, what's going on downtown, um, the, the uh, buildings that are being made, what our plans for the future of our downtown uh, area is. Secondly, uh, we just uh, passed an order to expand our um, urban renewal district, which is uh, our downtown uh, uh, financial development district. Uh, there will be a public hearing on that matter uh, come Monday, so I ask that everybody tune in to the uh, fi uh, finance committee meeting this coming Monday. You'll hear a lot about the Tuesday, sorry, Tuesday, Monday's a holiday. Um, Tuesday, uh, we'll be having a public hearing on the, uh, an amendment uh, to our, uh, our urban renewal district, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Sycamore Grove, uh, uh, this is a, a really great project that's uh, in the, uh, coming down the pipeline. Uh, I worked with the mayor uh, to uh, fully fund the Sycamore Grove project, which will be a, a, a public green space uh, behind the DUA building um, in our downtown area, so we'll talk about that. Uh, additionally, um, 
There's going to be an infrastructure improvement uh, to the Lyman Street, Kerry Street, Center Street uh, intersection. Uh, this is the um, Supreme House of Pizza intersection. Anybody who's driven through that intersection knows it can take you 20 minutes just to get through it. I was actually uh, stuck in traffic there uh, earlier today. Um, there's going to be a massive um, infrastructure uh, intersection improvement, and we'll discuss exactly what they're going to do with that intersection. Uh, additionally, um, street repaving. Now, uh, anybody who's driven through the ward knows uh, that our streets are terrible. I mean, there's really uh, no sugarcoating that. Our department, uh, DPW department, our highway department, they do a tremendous job trying to uh, patch the holes in our streets, but we need more than patches. Uh, we need complete reconstruction of the majority of our streets on, uh, in Ward 5. I work very closely with our uh, DPW commissioner, Mr. Patrick Hill. He does a fantastic job. It's, uh, we just need more funding, and, uh, and, I, and I work uh, very closely with him, the mayor's office, to get additional funding uh, for our uh, streets. All right, um, first thing is, is Christos, the Christos lot. Everybody knows what that is. It's, um, it's the lot that uh, uh, formerly held uh, the Christos restaurant. It goes from um, Crescent Street, uh, the Route 27, uh, to Beaumont Ave, uh, which is, uh, you know, the, uh, the residential street right behind it. It covers uh, the old Christo's lot, I mean, uh, the old Christo's restaurant, the uh, former Massasoit Convention Center, the um, uh, old movie theater uh, that behind there, up to and including uh, the parking lot that's in front of the old embassy, uh, the Brockton Health Center, and this uh, wooded area uh, uh, to the left. Altogether, this is uh, 6.3 acres, uh, 6.8 acres, and um, currently owned by the state and in, in desperate need of redevelopment. And so uh, over the past few years, what, we've had multiple use studies done on this lot. We had the uh, Donahue Institute from uh, UMass, uh, uh, U UMass Boston. We had the Urban Land Institute uh, come uh, to this lot and do a use study. They looked at the uh, infrastructure. They looked at the, the location, the, abut uh, the abutters, different stakeholders in the area, the current zoning uh, of the lot. And then uh, what they did was, uh, you know, we, we gave, went into some studies and determined what is the best use uh, uh, of this facility. And when they look at it, what they initially look at is its current zoning. Right now, the Christos lot is zoned as a C2 zone. C2 is uh, general retail and general office space. And so, as we know, general retail throughout the country has taken a hit. Um, on, uh, online shopping, Walmart, Walgreens, Family Dollar, uh, all of those types of stores has really, um, you know, uh, really detracted from brick and mortar um, resident, uh, retail, excuse me. Retail finds it much more cost effective to move into existing buildings, just like the, uh, um, the Family Dollar uh, from the East Side Plaza went over to the Rite Aid. It's much cheaper to uh, move into an existing building than it is to build a brand new building. Additionally, general office space, uh, it was determined that this, this lot is too far from the highway really to be uh, in demand for general office space. And so uh, what do we do? C2 is really not uh, in demand in this area. So went to the drawing board and we looked at turning uh, this area into a residential area. Back in September of 2020, I put together five different residential scenarios and presented that to the public. Now, when we say residential, we're, what we're mainly talking about is high density residential. So we're talking about anywhere between 250 to 300 apartment units on this property. I presented that uh, to my constituents, and the feedback was there's, there's little appetite for another high-density residential apartment, uh, residential complex uh, in this area, especially when across from Massasoit on Thatcher Street is going to be a high-density residential development uh, at the old uh, nursing, co uh, nursing convent, uh, excuse me, um, not nursing, um, Catholic convent across the street on Thatcher Street. So again, went back to the drawing board. 
And what, we, uh, what, what I did is, along with our city planner, uh, we developed a modernized C5 zone. And so what, a, what this, uh, our current C5 zone is professional office, all right? So we're talking doctor's offices, uh, lawyers, engineers, dentists, right? Professional office space. Um, it also includes um, um, uh, nursing homes and a hotel, if you can believe it. But what we said was, what can we add to the C5 to make the, our current C5 more conducive to quality development? And so we added new uses to the C5. And what those uses are basically are is um, research and development, development space. Uh, Massachusetts and New England in general has become a hub for biotechnology, for pharmaceuticals, for um, uh, uh, medical devices, computer, uh, computer technology. If you wanted to uh, bring your lucrative biotech company to Brockton, you couldn't do it. Our zoning doesn't allow for it. With this new C5 zone, it does. And so hopefully we can attract um, these higher end, high paying job uh, industries to Brockton. And so that's what I did. I, modernized, I, I filed an ordinance to modify the C5. And not just C5 for Christos, but for our whole city. Uh, the C5 also, our modernized C5 does also allow for senior residential and for assisted living. And so uh, that has already passed uh, with amendments of uh, our ordinance committee. It's, go it's been uh, read and referred uh, to our um, city council, and it's going to hear its second reading um, this, uh, this, the 27th, our next uh, city council meeting. It will require one more reading the following month for that ordinance to become law. Uh, my uh, my um, promise uh, to the residents of Brockton, or Ward 5, was that I would hold a meeting uh, discussing uh, the, uh, the, the modernization uh, of the uh, C5 zone and uh, um, rezoning Christos as this new modern C5. Again, these use studies made the determination that the highest best value for Brockton is for this this area to remain a commercial zone. And so that's what I, what I listened to that and that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make this, have it remain a commercial zone to bring high paying quality jobs to the residents of Brockton. That's my wish and, uh, and I'm gonna work with uh, the state who currently owns the land and all interested parties in making that happen. And so um, I know people talk about seems like another argument that I'm having, and we'll see this a democracy. Uh, we will vote on it as a city council, but there's been talk about the city acquiring uh, the Massasoit Convention Center to use as our own convention center or a community center. My position is I do not support this. I believe that the costs of uh, uh, acquiring uh, that convention center uh, the cost of maintaining it, bringing it up to code, it's, uh, re you know, it's in pretty poor condition, and also uh, maintaining it over the future, it's just really cost prohibitive for our city. My desire is to sell it all to uh, any future developer, uh, because that's pr the prime real estate, prime uh, commercial real estate, right there along the 27. Uh, to cut that piece off from the rest of the development, I think minimizes the value of the development, and I'd rather just sell it all and, and have a new developer come in and, and do what he believes is best within our zone uh, um, for that property. So does anybody have any questions about Christos? Uh, the state owns it. So it was sold, uh, Christos was sold uh, to the state uh, under the Patrick administration with the expectation that Massasoit would expand onto that property to build a new life sciences building. Once the Baker administration came in, they stopped the funding for that plan and, went, and actually Massasoit just moved forward with their own 
grant and plan to build that new building uh, on their existing campus. And so this is owned uh, by the state. There is special legislation right now uh, being proposed to allow for the sale of that property uh, and the proceeds of that sale to go directly to Massasoit uh, to fund the expansions of their facilities. Did you have a question about Crystal? I kind of would like to see Massasoit Convention Center stay there. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, that's the popular opinion. Uh, I'm not the last word on the matter. Uh, it will go before the City Council for further debate. I just believe um, that the costs associated with acquisition, maintenance, and, uh, um, you know, uh, just operation is just something that the City of Brockton shouldn't be involved in, especially when we can't even operate the Shaw Center properly. So. Uh, I think it was 1958, uh, the Payne School. Uh, students had to go over to the new, uh, at the time it was East Junior High School, because uh, the Payne School was falling down, yeah. blah, 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 too, money, too much money to pick, repair it, and all that. And guess what? The following year, there was 33 year conditioners in it, and it was opened up as an adult learning center. Yeah. And it's still going. Yep, no, I understand. Um, we're going to continue the discussion on that matter. I just uh, wanted to present what my opinion was. <clears throat> so downtown development. Uh, Ward 5 encompasses half of our downtown. Ward 5 ends at Main Street, uh, and then it continues on as Ward 2. So Councilor, uh, uh, Councilor Tavares and I uh, really own uh, the, uh, Brockton's downtown area. And I'm really excited about what's happening in our downtown. Uh, the residential uh, development that's going on in our downtown uh, will provide modern, new construction, high quality, luxury living uh, for uh, new residents of, our, uh, of Brockton. And so one of the ones I want to talk about is 93 Center Street. Uh, this is uh, the old Brockton Furniture Building. Uh, everybody, um, I think everybody's familiar uh, with the building. It's currently uh, being uh, renovated. It's going to have 55 uh, modern apartments, uh, 11 of them being affordable uh, apartments. So um, as we know, that this is a historic building. Part of the financing uh, is through Mass Historic Credits. And so what that means is a lot of the uh, historic attributes of this building uh, have to, uh, can't be touched and have to be uh, uh, maintained and uh, uh, brought back to uh, original condition if possible. So uh, that um, structure in the front uh, will not move. Uh, that high-end uh, trim, uh, I think it's aluminum, up top will, may, uh, will be refurbished. Uh, so this is uh, an excellent building, and it's going to uh, provide, again, uh, modern living uh, for the residents of downtown. Um, another one uh, that just made it through the zoning board is 46 Montello Street. Uh, this is uh, the old um, D'Angelo's building. Uh, the plan is to develop that into 46 market rate uh, luxury apartments. Uh, this is uh, being developed by Mr. Joffrey Anatoly, uh, who, um, who developed 47 West Elm Street and, uh, and 47 uh, Pleasant Street. So he has a track record of bringing uh, high-end uh, modern apartments to Brockton. This, this will be um, all uh, market rate apartment, uh, again, in the old D'Angelo's uh, parking, you know, the old D'Angelo's lot. And uh, this is going to be a, a, a fantastic addition to our downtown. So that's going to be a new building at D'Angelo's. De Correct. Lot. Well, there's another building similar to that one they're putting up right across the street. What's that? Correct. So that's our, our Trinity. Um, yeah. That would be this building right here. So that's phase two of uh, tr uh, the Trinity development. This is going to be 111 uh, um, units, 50% of them market rate, the other 50% uh, affordable. Uh, it's going to have a, a, a modern uh, courtyard uh, that both party, uh, that both buildings can share, uh, barbecues, lighting. Um, this is going to be a great facility. I had the opportunity to tour it uh, a few weeks ago with the vice president of Trinity Financial. This will be um, up and uh, operational fall of this year, and it's going to be another great addition uh, to our downtown. Where's all the parking? Uh, the par so underneath. Uh, so they have a underneath level uh, that will have 85 parking spots, and they rented the rest, uh, I believe, 25 spots in the uh, Bill Carpenter garage. 
Uh, so the D'Angelo building, is that going to have parking? Correct. I'll have, it's going to have, uh, uh, it's, you're going to rise up. So it's not going to be underground. You're going to drive up and that first level is going to be parking. So all parking will be on site. Where are we getting all these residents? Um, from Boston, uh, from the surrounding communities. Uh, we are, you know, we are a number one destination for those moving out of Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan. Uh, those who work in Boston have high paying jobs, but don't, but can't afford to uh, remain living in uh, Boston. People want a backyard. People want urban living, um, but not necessarily in Boston where they really can't afford the rents. Uh, Brockton is the uh, affordable alternative uh, to Boston. Another uh, project uh, that's being developed right now is 28 Petronelli Way. This is our old Petronelli gym. Uh, this uh, will be 18 market rate apartments. Um, this will be coming, along, uh, coming online again in the fall of 2022. Uh, again, uh, there's also going to be funding. Uh, there's going to be a new road uh, off of Petronelli Way. I filed the order to, to name this road Marvelous Marvin Hagler Drive. And on the other side of that, we're going to develop a pocket park uh, with a uh, tribute to Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Uh, we're going to have a statue uh, put there, and it'll be a, a, a place where uh, people can go and, uh, you know, uh, sit by the statue, enjoy lunch, and, uh, you know, uh, have a tribute to really a boxing icon. And so uh, I look forward to uh, that development. This is the old uh, uh, Petronelli boxing gym, and again, it's under development right now with the expectation that it'll be complete fall of 2022. Um, 22 Main Street, that the old Ganley building, it is now currently our new state unemployment office that's going to also house uh, Massasoit, Well, they'll have uh, different uh, activities um, uh, in this building. Um, Trinity Phase 2, we just talked about. Uh, that again will be uh, coming online in fall of 2022, and I'm really excited to announce that Brockton Beer Company um, has opened up on Main Street, 147 Main. We're calling it Sycamore on Main. Um, it was opened on um, June 3rd of this year. I already sat there, had a beer, great place to enjoy uh, a beverage with friends, and I recommend everybody, please, uh, uh, um, you know, go go visit this place, have a drink with some friends. It's a great, uh, great, um, a great establishment, and here it is, right here. Okay, moving on, our um, urban renewal district. So uh, Brockton in our downtown uh, basically has an urban renewal district. What an urban renewal district is, is it, it has, um, it's basically a boundaried area in which we identify different parcels of land for development or redevelopment. Um, because it's within our urban renewal district, there are different uh, financial um, incentives uh, that are attached that allow for the development uh, of these buildings. Um, every building that I just mentioned is part of our urban renewal district and has had some um, support both from the local, state, and uh, uh, federal financing to allow these buildings uh, to be completed. So um, what we're doing now is we're uh, uh, um, amending our urban renewal district because uh, it was originally established in 2016. And uh, what we're doing now is uh, as time passes, uh, different opportunities present themselves, uh, different parcels are developed at different times. And now that we see, have a, we, we've basically taken stock of where we are right now and now have decided how we're gonna move forward. And so we're making amendments to our urban renewal district to identify new parcels for development or redevelopment. Uh, again, there will be a public hearing on this uh, come Tuesday, uh, uh, the 27th. So uh, these are some of the uh, properties uh, that are uh, further uh, identified. If you look at Frederick Douglass Way, uh, those, orange, um, those orange spots right there, we see NM, uh, that's, the Stadler, uh, that's the Stadler building going from basically the back of Sycamore on, uh, uh, Sycamore on Main, where Brockton Bear Company is, all the way to Warren Ave. Uh, we're looking to redevelop that whole area, put a new um, parking garage there, because we gotta provide more parking for our, our residents. Excuse me, where is Sycamore? Uh, so, uh, so I call it Sycamore on Main, where the Brockton Bear Company is, right on Main Street, right across from uh, City Hall. If you got City Hall, then that parking, you know where Elvira's is? Yes. Across the street from Elvira's, that's what we call Sycamore on Main. Well, we, we have a Sycamore Street in Brockton, it's yep. up at the west side. Yep. And to call it Sycamore on Main, it's like... 
Well, it's just because Brockton has a lot of sycamore trees. We're known for our sycamore trees, especially our Liberty tree, which was a sycamore tree. Yeah. Well, it, we're going to develop it, and it's it's going to look it's going to look awesome. Um, so, one of the um, additional developments that's coming to Brockton uh, that's going to be paid for uh, fully through our ARPA funds is uh, Sycamore, uh, Sycamore Grove. So uh, this is a public green space that's located behind the DUA building, um, which is on Main Street. And it, it, the current plans call for a music stage, uh, seating on turf or lawn. Uh, it's going to have a, a, a spacious uh, room under planted trees and canopies where uh, vendors can set up tables and booths for craft fairs, green markets, other events. Uh, there will be a music stage. Uh, and there will be lockable bathrooms and a vendor building uh, where uh, those vendors can provide uh, food and drink for those who visit this area. So this is, a, this is kind of a, um, a, a model of it. I also have this. So um, this will be the entrance on Crescent Street where you, know, where you could drive in. Um, Joe Angelo's, uh, I think uh, this is the DUA building, Preto's, and this is um, the old McSweeney's. So um, the idea is to have uh, some outdoor dining um, behind these buildings. Um, we'll have a music a movable music stage, uh, some grass areas for seating, watching the music, um, a vendor building uh, that will be able to provide um, you know, food and drink for those. Uh, who uh, are coming down to this area uh, to just have a good time. Uh, we'll have uh, civic events, um, you know, uh, different, uh, you know, other events, craft fairs. Uh, we, we, we plan to have a management company uh, that would operate this and uh, bring different entertainment uh, to this area. So uh, this has been fully funded. We expect uh, uh, the um, uh, building date uh, probably later this fall, if not later this fall, then early next spring. I think this is going to be a great area for the residents of downtown and residents throughout Brockton to come, congregate, spend time with each other, have a cold drink, uh, visit one of these restaurants, um, and just really enjoy each other's company. We do not have something like this in our downtown. We desperately need it, and uh, um, you know, I worked with the mayor's office to get this done, so this is coming. So um, I'm really excited about that. Um, next. The, the improvements to the uh, North Kerry Center Street Lyman intersection. And so this is an intersection that we just stated earlier. It, it's a mess to get through. So this is currently on our tip list. Um, we've had multiple public hearings on this matter. Uh, the expected um, um, construction date is spring of 2024. And this is what uh, they, they look to do. They're going to... Um, uh, their, their proposal is to provide new traffic signals, widen and repair the roadway, um, construct new sidewalks, new signals will be mounted on a mast arm, taking uh, them off the street, uh, off the corners. Uh, that will provide increased visibility, install pedestrian crossing signals with countdown timers. Uh, the new signals will, will include emergency preemption. So when a uh, fire or uh, uh, it's right there, right next to Brockton Hospital. So when uh, ambulances or fire apparatus, uh, they can stop the light and, and then allow them to go through. Um, the, it's going to be timed uh, in conjunction with uh, the type of traffic that this uh, area has. Um, and it can be adjusted if uh, conditions change. It's going to um, uh, widen the roadway, and it's going to allow for an exclusive left turn. Uh, everybody gets jammed up. You can't, you can't make that left turn uh, because of the other traffic that's coming your way. So we'll have an exclusive left lane with a left turn signal, allowing traffic to flow more freely through that intersection. There will also be bicycle lanes. Um, it's going to increase, it's going to take some of the land uh, from, uh, from actually every corner. That's going to increase the turn radius. A lot of times what happens, you get a big truck coming through, and they can't turn because it's too tight. And so it's going to open up the area and allow these trucks to make their turns. Um, also, uh, it's going to be ADA compliant, and um, it's gonna, they're going to widen it to two 11-foot vehicle lanes. Uh, one 10 foot uh, left turn exclusive lane on both sides, and then uh, uh, 
two five-foot uh, bicycle lanes on both sides, and, the, and also uh, new sidewalks on both sides. So this is a, a long time coming. Um, it's going to be a great improvement uh, to the ward. It's going to allow uh, traffic to flow more freely through this intersection. And um, this is just the, the next infrastructure improvement happening in Brockton or in Ward 5. Uh, we will further uh, down the line talk about uh, Plymouth Street, Crescent Street, um, and, and some additional uh, traffic lights uh, that are going to um, get investments in to improve uh, the quality of life in Brockton. Uh, this is the project area. I think everybody's familiar with it. Um, but, and the road will be repaved. And so this is just really one of those great infrastructure improvements uh, to improve the quality of life of our residents. Um, speaking of infrastructure improvements, um, I've been working with the DPW uh, Highway Department to try to pave as many roads as possible in the ward. As I previously stated, we all know the condition. They're terrible. Um, they, uh, we're kind of, uh, I'm tired of the patching over. What we need is complete reconstruction. And so I'm working with the city to get that done. Uh, so far, I've uh, had the complete repaving um, with uh, Short Street, Quincy Ave, Addison Ave. The next two streets to be paved is uh, Portland Street, which is going to begin next week. Uh, complete reconstruction of Portland Street and hopefully fix some of the drainage issues uh, that they currently have on that street. Um, later, my next street is going to be Ashfield Drive. I don't know if uh, those obviously who live on Ashfield Drive know the condition. Uh, you need a tank to drive down that. Uh, residents talk to me all the time. They can't even have their kids drive their bike down that street. It's so bad. We're going to get to it. It's one of my. It's my highest priority street, and it's going to get done later this year. Uh, additionally, I'm working with the engineering department to um, accept as public ways both Bud Ave and. Um, in Ida Ave. That way, when they become public ways, uh, they will be eligible for um, repaving. And so I'm trying to identify these little private ways throughout our ward and have them accepted as public ways. Uh, everybody on those streets pay the same taxes. Uh, they should have the ability to have their road repaved. So I'm working on that as well. Cleanup efforts, uh, I, again, on my Facebook page, and I've put out flyers. I've held multiple cleanup efforts. Uh, as stated, you know, our city gets dirty over time. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is our community. Uh, we should uh, provide some help to uh, clean up our city, and I try to do that as often as possible. Uh, I've had multiple cleanup efforts, both at Salisbury Park, uh, right next to the Pliff School, and uh, I just recently in April had a Ward 5 downtown cleanup event. Uh, we removed over 150 bags of trash from Salisbury Brook and uh, 75 bags of trash from the downtown. Uh, this is uh, some of the trash that we pulled out of uh, Salisbury Park. I want to thank uh, everybody uh, that participated in that event. We'll have many more uh, over the next uh, uh, few years. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, and again, this is uh, my crew for our downtown cleanup event. Uh, beautiful crew, um, and uh, we, we appreciate your help. Um, just a few things. I'm working on new neighborhood watches. I've helped establish two new neighborhood watches. Um, uh, really successful. Um, so if you want to be a captain for a neighborhood watch uh, so that you can establish one in your area or your, um, you know, your area of town, please reach out to me. I'm looking for neighborhood captains. These events are really helpful, uh, not only as event, uh, as uh, groups uh, to discuss public safety, but also really to bring the community together. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of turnover in the neighborhoods over the past 10, 15 years. A lot of people really don't know each other. This is an opportunity to get together, uh, spend some time together, recognize who each other are, and then you know really get to know, know your neighbors. So I recommend, um, please, if you want to be a neighbor Neighborhood captain, I'm looking for as many as possible. Uh, give me a call and we'll establish a neighborhood watch in your neighborhood. Um, Brockton is looking for uh, board members, uh, looking for sit, uh, residents to serve as uh, members on our board. So we're looking for volunteers. We currently have openings on the License Commission, Conservation Commission, Planning Board, Zoning Board, Parking Authority, our Cultural Council, Women's Commission, Diversity Commission. You've got to be a Brockton resident. You've got to be available for these meetings. Um, it's helpful to have some background uh, in the uh, commission that you're looking to serve on, but if not, 
Um, that's fine. We just need people who want to be involved in the community. I served on our licensing commission for a year. I served on our zoning board of appeals for two years. Learned a lot about what's happening in Brockton. Um, and, and that gave me what I think a good knowledge base uh, to be an effective city councilor. So um, please, if you, got, if you have the time um, and the energy, please. I, uh, you can send your application to Brady Winston um, uh, in the mayor's office, and uh, show, uh, the mayor will uh, review your, your uh, resume and, 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 and discuss the matter with you. All right, um, we said 8 o'clock. Uh, we're five minutes to 8. Really went through that pretty quick. Um, I'm gonna, this, so this is being recorded right now. Uh, the slides will be more available in uh, post-editing uh, for, um, for the BCA. And so um, I'm going to open it up just for a few. Uh, we got about five minutes. Anybody have any questions about the matters I just discussed? What does Ward 5 encompass? Like, where do we start? What's yep. Or go to Main Street? Yep. So it, it, our ward's a little jaggered, right? So it's not straight lines, but essentially um, the, the um, Whitman-Brockton line, both from the 14 and the 27, the Abington-Brockton line, the 123, up to East Ashland, generally, and all of that moving towards west to downtown, to Main Street. That's the general outline of the ward. It's the largest geographic ward. Um, outside of seven, that encompasses um, DW Park. But uh, let's say, um, and it's not the number one population, but it's, 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 it's one of the biggest in Brockton. Going to, say, we go to Main Street, how far down on Main Street? <clears throat> so basically to the Y, the, the library, the Y, and then going the other way, um, Woodward's Auto, like that, that area right there. So kind of, that's the general boundaries. Yes, ma'am. Um, it goes south at least to uh, Perkins and Lawrence. Yep. It, no, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't. 5A. Yes. So, right. So then. And how it goes up to Maine, how far, I don't know. Right. It, 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 it does. It, it includes up to Lawrence. Um, the Trinity, Trinity um, Apartments, the Trinity Village, it includes that. And it goes up Summer Street, up until uh, I think it's uh, Bates Row, or, uh, um, Parker? Pa Parker. Parker, so up there. And then from there it turns into four. Hey, to love and leave you, but I gotta get the bus. Yes, ma'am. You. Enjoy your day, thank you for coming. Anybody else? All right, well, I want to thank everybody for appearing tonight. Um, I, I always have a really great time uh, having these uh, meetings. It's very important to keep uh, the people uh, informed about what's happening in our ward. I will have uh, more of these meetings. Um, I'm going to have more podcasts um, and, and just, uh, you know, try to provide as much information to the people as possible. It really has been a pleasure serving uh, as your uh, city councilor for the past three years. I look forward to the next year. Please reach out. This only works if we're all involved in the discussion. And so any questions, I'm available anytime. Reach out to me and, um, you know, I'm, I'm here to serve. I truly am. Thank you for your time. Good night.